let's come then to your your third and largest book, The Long Goodbye, um, Quezon Revisited. And I think the central story is the story of Tom Mahoney. Um, so Tom Mahoney uh, signs up to go into the Marine Corps. Uh, you see him in his truck. You ask what's going on. He says, I just joined the Marine Corps. You want to come with me? You say, yeah. So you get into the Marine Corps in that moment because, you know, Tom Mahoney had done so and asked you if you wanted to, to join up. Um, just, just to start this, if you could just tell us a little bit about him and your service with him. Uh, he, you know, Tom was uh, really well liked, and uh, I was, I had self esteem issues. Uh, you know, I had a rough home life with my dad and uh, I was tenuously living there and so forth. Um, his, his dad had died during the Korean conflict, not in Korea, but he, after 30 or more combat bombings, he was a navigator on a bomber um, in the Air Force um, and came home to Ellington Air Force Base. Uh, after his tour and died in an automobile accident a few days later, was buried in um, the National Cemetery in the Presidio in San Francisco. Um, I bring that point up because Tom's body, Tom has his name engraved on the back of that mm -hmm. tombstone, Thomas Patrick Mahoney II, Thomas Patrick Mahoney III. It's, that's kind of heartbreaking to see a couple of generations uh, on, that, uh, on that same stone. Uh, but he was very popular and he, um, uh, a kid uh, in high school, and so uh, I was kind of honored that he, you know, he liked me, and I was part of that group. And so there was uh, kind of that dynamic. Uh, but um, he was also uh, he also had kind of a, a death wish. I just talked to a friend of mine last night, a mutual friend of ours, uh, Tom. So, um, and uh, you know, he had a this motorcycle. He had he. Would, I was on the back of it one time when he was doing 100 miles an hour down the freeway. I could barely turned my head over his shoulder to see the speedometer. Um, he, he crashed the car a couple of times. So he he was kind of wild in that respect. And, and that kind of plays into the dilemma of trying to figure out what, what and I don't want to jump the gun, but why he did what he did later in Vietnam. Um, but uh, yeah, so I was honored when he asked me, um, didn't think twice about it. We went to boot camp, we were in the same platoon in boot camp, but right after boot camp, uh, I went to radio school and he went to, um, to become a 03, uh, an infantryman. And coincidentally, his unit was the one that, and I didn't see him after that, but we wrote quite a bit. Uh, and coincidentally, it was his unit that took over from us on April 18th um, at Quezon. So I almost I just missed seeing him there. April 18th, 68. So what happened? Because of course the, the theme of the book is, you know, Tom is killed in the war. Um, and, but then his body's not recovered. And so then that begins a long process of seeing if we can recover the body, if we can recover the remains. Um, how was Tom killed in the war? What were, what were the circumstances around that? Well, you know, this is interesting. I knew he was killed um, and, um, uh, but I didn't know the circumstances and I didn't want him to be honest with you for many, many years. Uh, finally, I contacted uh, um, the DPMO, uh, take that back, uh, the National Archives to get some records on him. And, and even when that package came, uh, and it, it, it was the DPMO now that I mentioned, because it was, it dealt with all the recovery efforts that had been made since they first thought of going in there in 1974, they actually thought of, of, of going looking for him. But um, uh, I couldn't open the envelope. And my wife kids me about it to this day. Uh, it sat on my desk for, several weeks and it just, so there was something going on inside my head for sure. Mm. But I finally opened it and uh, it started my journey to find out what happened to him. I uh, thank God right at that time, the internet started becoming very widespread and, and popular. And so a lot of information was available online that hadn't been if I tried earlier. So I met one of his uh, platoon mates who had been um, there when he died. And then I met through them, met another, another met platoon commander and squad leader got to know his whole, virtually his whole platoon that survived the war and survived afterwards. Um, and picture came together and it was very disturbing to me. Um, I had uh, I got a letter from him on July 4th of 68. Uh, Quezon was the last bunker in Quezon was being blown, had been blown up and it was quiet now. They 
Marines were down there, spent a month tearing the place up, destroying anything of value, explosions going on all day. Getting ready to evacuate. The Marines were evacuating Quezon. They were. They finally, uh, General Westmoreland, if I could just backtrack uh, put this in historical context, General Westmoreland, um, who, who had his own ego issues, um, in my opinion, he, um, he refused to give up Quezon because I believe that he felt that would be um, an embarrassment to him. So we had, everybody had to wait till he was promoted to Army Chief of Staff and left Vietnam. And General Craig Abrams took over immediately. And the first thing he did was say, get out of Quezon. So they, this was in June. So they sent uh, the Italian Marines up to destroy the base, blow it up. Um, and Tom was on Hill 881. And he'd known I'd been to Quezon. And he was, according to his buddies, he was very disturbed that uh, we were walking away from this after all the people that had died there and sacrificed there. He wrote me a letter two days before. Yeah, I got it after his death. I didn't know about his death for about a month, but um, I read about it in Stars and Stripes. He just mm. didn't really know. Uh, but, um, uh, he wrote me a letter and he was very discouraged. He was always upbeat and he just, he, he, he was even thinking earlier of becoming an officer and staying in the Marine Corps. He loved it. Uh, and um, anyway, he decided uh, that he hated it, hated everything and what they're doing. And, and then two days later, um, he, when they were waiting for the helicopters to take them, where they're abandoning 881, which as you know, uh, in the hill fights of 67, the Marines paid a dear price in blood to take that hill. Um, and they were leaving and they were waiting for the helicopters. And Mahoney got up and uh, left his weapon and walked through the zigzag trail out to outside the barbed wire um, to relieve himself, even though there was a head left undestroyed on the hilltop. Um, and the North Vietnamese uh, recon team was out there, five guys. They shot him point blank. Um, they didn't want to shoot him as I talked to one of them. Uh, he's still alive. I talked to him just a few years ago. Um, yeah. But uh, they wanted, they were waiting to shoot the helicopter there uh, full, of, full of Marines. They were waiting because he knew where the LZ was. But Mahoney saw him. He said Mahoney looked over and saw him. So the squad leader shot him and twice in the chest. He died instantly. Um, they dragged his body um, down into a better ambush site. And of course, Marines um, you know, were told that you never leave a body behind. And they fought over his body all day long. And um, uh, finally had to get him killed. Finally, the officer who was Robert Barrow, who was commanding officer, who later became commandant, I said, get off the hill now. Absolutely, leave him and get off the hill. And even after that, they continued to make effort. Um, but um, the North Vietnamese were good at that, you know, um, especially at Quezon. Um, uh, they used, uh, as I say, the Marine motto of Semper Fidelis, always faithful, as one of the Marines' greatest liabilities mm -hmm. in Quezon, because if they got a hold of a body, they knew they were going to shoot at least five other guys trying to get it, and it, that's the way it played out over and over and over again. Anyway, um, so Tom's out there. They left the hill. Um, they fought at a nearby hill you know, the night where the Marines were trying to get 10 bodies that were outside the wire and ambush on Hill 689. They finally abandoned the base entirely a week later. So other Marines were wounded as, as they tried to go get Tom's body? Yeah, there were three other Marines. I, I got to meet them all. Um, uh, and get information um, and the platoon commander. Um, and uh, yeah, they were wounded. One, Bruce Bird, was wounded seriously in the neck. He survived. Uh, the others were um, shot in various parts of their body and survived. Um, one of the things I failed to mention was I, I think compounded Tom's mental state was that at, in the midst of this depression about abandoning 881 and abandoning Quezon, nearby Quezon Base, which was just five miles away. Um, he got a dear John letter from his girlfriend and she was calling him. She, she was um, um, now involved in the anti-war movement and she kind of laid all the rhetoric on him, the baby killer stuff. And, um, so that was, I think, the final straw. I think it was a combination of things. Um, we'll do, never know. Do you know, does the girlfriend who wrote that letter, uh, surely she, you know, soon learned that Tom had been killed in in battle or had been killed after reading her letter and then going outside the wire to relieve himself. Although, as you say, there was a head, an operational head still yeah. uh, where he was. So it wasn't necessary to, to go outside. Um, do you know, did, did she ever learn that he did what he did after reading her letter? And so it's reasonable to think there's a connection between those two things. Do you know if she ever learned learned that fact? Um, 
I'm sure she did. I've never had contact with her. Uh, I was real angry. I didn't want to have contact with her because I was afraid I'd, I'd do something bad. But that, you know, that went away as it goes on. And uh, but uh, I did hear. Uh, I, I believe she's read the book, and so um, uh, I hear. I hear from mutual friends of hers. Um, she went to a memorial service um, with a mutual friend um, that they had for Tom. Um, it was. A, it was as you uh, uh, as you know that process is uh it's kind of interesting so they didn't have a memorial service for another month or so mm. uh, but she attended that and left early i think people thought that she appeared to be uh, and, and didn't want to confront people so i would have just to extrapolate from that um and i you know again i was so angry about it when i got back uh, i don't I just I, it's all gone you know the, the venom has played itself out sure. but um what happened was uh in the long goodbye, as I explained, um, because the body's not recovered, they can't confirm that it's KIA until they do an investigation. Of course, now the whole area is abandoned. There's no way of. So, um, uh, Lieutenant Garot, his name was, with, with, was the Italian headquarters, uh, first time, first marine, started the investigation, um, contacted, had people contact the Marines that were wounded at various hospitals where they were, in statements. Was he alive? Did he appear to be alive? And, and all of them said he, he didn't appear to be alive. Um, and and late, I later found out a few years ago from one of the people that was on the, the 18 that he died instantly. Um, but, um, uh, so they did this whole thing. So Tom's mom, who had you know, lost her, you know, her husband you know, in Korea um, and during the Korean conflict, um, she had to wait 45 days. Uh, and they were going to send her a message. Her son's missing. We're looking for him. Two weeks later, all the way through the month of July, she was getting messages from the Marine Corps that um, uh, they were looking for him. So she was given this array of hope, uh, which was to me, I've read all these communiques, by the way. And um, so um, finally they sent her uh, and sent somebody over um, and uh, explained to her that they made a determination that he's, uh, he was, he's dead, but his body was mm. not recoverable. Mm. I imagine she was experiencing what. Um what you hear people say who have someone who's missing um you know of course living with the hope that maybe he's just been captured and will be released and and that sort of thing i imagine she's living with that for for some time yeah you know um 1975 when uh, all the pow's were repatriated uh she was still still he was going to show up wow, wow. It's a long time well, and, and it goes on because the body never is recovered. And there are a number of, of um, accounts you relate in, in your book, you know, where the recovery or the attempt to recover Tom's remains, um, you know, it's the, that's the, the central theme of the book. And there are a number of, of, of things you recount in there. Um, my understanding though, is that no remains have been recovered. Right. Um, as late as 2017, um, you know, and I won't get into all the details with the, uh, um, the, the joint POW, MIA, accountability command and all that, but um, it was a long process. Uh, finally, um, as late as 2017, I arranged to have his platoon commander and his squad leader go there with the, uh, with the JPAC, with uh, the recovery, American joint recovery team with the Vietnamese. And, uh, and I find an area, like I, I mentioned in the book, um, it was frustrating for me because they were looking in the wrong place. And uh, um, it was, you know, it just, I was beyond belief that they were wasting all this time and money. They were doing major excavations involved hiring 60 locals to dig. I mean, and, and I kept saying, they're on the wrong hill. Anyway, uh, again, finally they came around and uh, they, they've isolated an area of 60 meters by 60 meters. Um, you know, there's been a lot of rain, a hillside steep, so I'm sure any remains that are there, if, if any, yeah. um, are way down the hill. Um, and, you know, they've had some, the good news is, is the, I was talking with a, an admiral who was running the DPMO, retired mm -hmm. Admiral uh, John Craig, and um, he was saying that the um, uh, good news is, is that uh, they can find the tiniest bit of DNA now, and, and they can, um, they can re reproduce it. A sample size enough to um, to identify the remains. Right. But the bad news is, is after almost 60 years in that environment, with, not to be rude, but with the 
you know, the animals and the insects and the weather. Um, it's very unlikely. And the very acidic, the very acidic soil. I, I yes. think I think at this point, you know, teeth would be what you would get. Teeth, or you know, a, 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 a person who was in on a rescue mission when I was in the village, the army uh, came to, to a helicopter to try to reinforce us, and were shot up and had to leave, and a couple of them died. So it was right at that time in January of '68. One of those bodies was recovered and identified because, surprisingly, you know, those plastic new plastic combat boots we had, they had rubber soles, mm. little, little metal plate in them, they were a uh, nylon wool. Well, uh, apparently big toe bones could survive a long time inside one of those boots. And wow. they identified him by a big enough sample of his big toe bone. But wow. uh, yeah, to answer your question, I kind of, I, don't, I never lose hope, but um, there's lots of different things that could happen. But I, I think as time goes on, it's gonna be less likely they're gonna find him. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm interested in what you describe here where, you know, you've got the, you know, now it's no longer JPEG, DPMO, these government agencies that are tasked with finding remains of, of the missing. Now it's a, it's a different agency within the Department of Defense. But you're describing this situation where, um, if, if what I'm hearing you, if I, if I hear you right, you're on the ground there in you know, old, the northern part of old South Vietnam, the northwestern part there, you're on the ground telling them this is the wrong place, um, but they continue investing a lot in that place that you know is wrong. Um, and was that because they didn't believe you or was that because this is where the bureaucracy says we should dig and we're gonna dig here even though we know there's nothing here because the bureaucracy says so and to dig somewhere else work is gonna take a whole nother bureaucratic thing to do that. I mean, was that, was that just a, was it miscommunication or do you feel like it was primarily just bureaucratic nonsense that led to all of this investment in this one instance anyway, digging in a place that you knew was wrong? Um, all of the above, yeah. yeah um, I think it was a little of both. Um, I think that I was I wasn't a trained, um, you know, in you know, it's a forensic scientist for one thing, and or you know, an archaeologist, um, and which these guys usually have degrees in these people, and, and consequently, um, you know, they weren't going to take any information from the you know neophyte. But it's not even the information going in, but the information coming out of the DPMO is like pulling teeth, you know. Um, they're very close to the vest. You know, I investigated them at one point during my investigation. I found out they had a thousand sets of bones at Hickam Field at their central laboratory there that have yet to be even looked at. And I'm like, what? Well, you know, how do you know he's not among them? Anyone that's been to the Marine Corps Museum in Conoco, the, the Vietnam exhibit contains a it's kind of a helicopter, it's in the back of a CH-46. And when you walk out the back, there's a diorama of Hill 881. And wow. Hill 881 consists of two knolls, one made main knoll and one smaller knoll where Mahoney's body is. And they're separated by about 500 meters. So you walk out there and you're on the main position and you're looking over at, at, the, at the Western edition where Mahoney's body is, okay. So I wrote, um, and they were digging where the helicopter was, essentially the same position on the main hill. Oh, yeah. So I wrote them, and after three or four times, very frustrated, I wrote them and said, in Crystal City, which is only a few miles from Quantico. I said, please, drive down to Quantico, go to the Marine Corps exhibit, walk out the back of the helicopter, look straight ahead. That's where Mahoney is. You're digging where the helicopter is. And that seemed to get some attention. It was kind mm -hmm. of, was so um, basic, you know? But, um, Anyway, so that's, that's part of the frustration. Yeah. What is the difference? Um, you, you fought with Marines, new Marines who did not survive the war. And then there's Tom who did not survive the war, but his remains also never came home. So other Marines, you know, did not survive the war, but their, their remains came home. There's a place you can go to, and and you you said that Tom's name is is on a grave marker there on the backside of his dad's grave marker, but there's no sense of being able to go visit Tom, which is you know an interesting concept. It, you know you talk to people who 
the remains they they do get back after a few decades are a dog tag and a tooth you know um but it's in a casket and there's that sense of this is tom and there's a place i can go to and visit tom um but of course in this specific, specific instance there's no there there are no remains as a combat veteran as somebody who knows what it's like to remember killed in action but we know where the remains are and then to know somebody who's killed in action but we don't know whatever happened to those remains and there's no place we can go to visit tom what is the what is the difference and i, I i'm getting what's informing this question is this idea of you know the the things we carry that title that famous yeah. vietnam uh, novel um the things we carry during war the things we combat veterans carry after war What's, what's the difference between carrying memories of killed in action, but we know where their remains are, and carrying killed in action, but we don't know where their remains are? Um, good question. You know, on a logical level, it makes absolutely no sense. Um, and, and I agree with that. And once you uh, thoroughly convince that he's not a POW, then it really is a, is, is a funny area. Um, why why is it different and i guess it's um and it's evolved with me you know, um over the years as a pain kind of went away and the guilt kind of went away um the uh i think i do it um because someone who's killed there and comes back you know they're kind of honored and their family that's like you mentioned that's something they know they're there even if it's only a fragment of them um uh, but in tom's case it evolved, and I didn't even consciously recognize this, but it evolved in, um, he can't come back physically, but um, I can keep his memory um, alive because, mm -hmm. there's, you know, I mean, he does have that carving on the stone, but um, imagine if it wasn't there, then there's really no record of, of him. So it's become more of that, but, you know, um, he was a good person. Uh, he, he was troubled at the end, um, but, uh, you know, just want to uh, recognize that. So I, I don't, yeah, I, I think that's just the difference um, mm -hmm. in my own mind. I, I feel that he may not be remembered if, if I don't keep up the fight. So I'm assuming this is a motivation you had to write that particular book. Yes. Right? Yeah. And we've just, we've touched on just a little bit, um, but there are a number of stories that, that come up in relation to this theme of, of trying to find Tom's remains. Um, I think this might be the last question. In the in the eighties, um, there was a thing that swept through the culture, an intense interest in POWs. You know, the question: Are POWs still held in Vietnam? Um, and there's you know a, a lot of interest uh, in that, and even you know even the Rambo movies got in got into that a bit, and the um, you know organizations are formed devoted to finding out, do we still have living POWs in Vietnam? Did that, did that uh, come much into your consciousness? Did that become part of your, part of the theme of your work as well? I mean, did you ever find yourself, were you con absolutely convinced that Tom had been killed in Vietnam? Did, do you still think, well, maybe he was wounded and, and captured? How did that process go for you? Yeah, that, that's interesting because at that time I hadn't, I hadn't done the research and found, you know, the North Vietnamese observations of the Marines. I didn't even know anything about his death at that time. Wow. Um, so, yeah, I, I think I kept up hope that um, he, he would, um, would come back. Um, I read voraciously everything I could about potential um, POWs. You know, there was the case of, um, what's his name, Robert Barwood. He was a mm -hmm. Marine that um, decided that once he was captured, or maybe even some believe he went over to the VC outside of Da Nang and, and ended up being a prison guard in, in, uh, of Americans in, uh, in one of the camps. And, and finally, I think it, much long, maybe in the early 80s or very late 70s, he decided to come home. Came back, yeah. Marshall. Guys like that, I mean, not that Tom would do that, but I mean, I'm just saying there's possibilities where somebody's there, uh, maybe. Maybe they went a little, you know, maybe the depression would make somebody flip to the other side. I don't know. So um, yeah, it always, I think it was always in my mind. But once I re 
research enough, I, I was convinced that he had not survived. And, um, and then I, then I began to, after again, after so much reading about POWs, I was convinced by the 90s that there were none there. Um, I mean, I'm glad to see a flag once in a while on the poll uh, to remember them, but I, you know, it's just would be hard for me to believe anybody is living that was uh, captured during the war. At this point. I imagine you've been to the wall in DC. Yeah. Um, I can't think of a better way of putting the question. What's, you know, what is that for you? How does that go for you? Um, the wall in DC. Yeah, I mean, the first time I saw it was at night and it was lit up and uh, yeah, I, I I did like almost every other veteran I know, I started crying. I mean, it, it's, um, yeah, to, to see all those names, you know, yeah, I think it's a beautiful thing. I know there was some criticism about its design years ago, but uh, I think it's it's, it's amazingly uh, yeah. provocative. And, you know, you, you walk down and you see some family members put a putter up against the wall and, you, you know, you, yeah, well, I had a lump in my throat the whole time I was there, every time I go there. Um, but, you know, of course, I've seen Tom and some other friends' names on there. But, um, yeah, it's to me, it's a, it's a very moving piece of work. 